I had to wonder, was I in Ireland at all? We never come early to meetings, but then I thought, I've got a new, we've got a new kind of Irishman and Irish woman here. So praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, it's wonderful to be here together this morning. I want to thank uh, Patrick Walsh and his team for, for opening up the church and for hosting this meeting here this morning. Um, it's an unusual thing to do in Ireland for, for a church to host a meeting that Israel is the subject. Yeah, and it's an amazing thing. I mean, we, we have a book that I, I think nearly every page has got Israel on it, but it's the one subject that never seems to get mentioned in, in, in churches. And so, so here we are. So thank you, Patrick and, and your team. Uh, it's wonderful to do that. It's, it hasn't been easy actually to find venues in Ireland and, and uh, a little bit more feedback still, is there? Or maybe it's my hearing aids. We, we don't want that. Um, it's, it's certainly been very uh, difficult to find secular, even, venues to, to put on meetings. And we've been, we've been cancelled uh, in the past few months. And uh, one actually explicitly turned us down because we were going to have the ambassador for Israel there. And uh, so they said, sorry, we wouldn't want, we wouldn't want her. And uh, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's a sad day, but anyway, we're, we're really thankful for what we do have from the Lord, and I'm very grateful for everyone who's come this morning. I know some people have traveled from long, long distances to, to be here as well, so it's a, a great blessing. So we've a, we've a busy schedule, so I'm going to keep uh, remarks to, to a minimum. Um, I just do want to say uh, washrooms and stuff are just out this exit here and round the corner to the, to the right. Um, we'd be planning to break for, for coffee. What time is that? Um, at around 11.40. And then we'd be planning having lunch together at 1 o'clock. And you're more than welcome to stay. Uh, we're providing lunch uh, for that. So if I could ask maybe Paul, would you open in prayer? Wonderful to have Paul and Nula with us here this morning. Mm. Just seek the Lord's blessing Amen. on our time together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We think of Jerusalem back in just a few days, 50 days after Jesus, 10 days or so after Jesus' ascension, a few days after his ascension. They were all together in one accord, waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the instructions from heaven for the next stage. Father God, we think, we believe we're on a turning point, a changing point in the move of your spirit in the land and in the spiritual direction of the nation. We ask you, Lord, that this will be a morning of destiny, of breakthrough, of revelation, of impartation, of shifting, of a commanded blessing from heaven. And Lord, as the heavens are opened by the blood of Jesus, we ask you from your bright throne above to command a blessing, an impartation, a movement of your Holy Spirit that will change the nation and change us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Paul. I'm just going to hand over to uh, Brendan and his worship team, Zamar. And Zamar means a harmonious and collective praise. So, amen. amen. Thank amen. you, Brendan. Oh, 
earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in life, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. Beginning and the end 
with sacrifice of praise. Amen. He is worthy of all the glory and honor and praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord from Kerry, from Limerick. Amen. 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 From Cork. Amen. From Carlo. We praise the Lord in this land. You are worthy of all the glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Hallelujah. And Father, I, I pray that you receive our prayers today through Jesus, Amen. the coming Amen. Messiah. Lord, we have much to say in this land. But Lord, we have no knowledge until we know you. Lord, we have no knowledge until we know Thank the you, word Jesus. of God. Would you forgive us in this land, Lord, for our ignorance and, and lack of understanding. And I pray that the ruah, that the breath, a new breath, a new wind, Lord, coming up um, from the islands into this nation, running through all this nation, Lord, so that there will be a harvest of souls, so that the children, Lord, would learn what it is to praise and worship. Lord, we're small people with big prayers, and we serve a victorious God. And in the book of Revelation, it says that they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And nothing can stand in front of you, Lord. So we're encouraged in the company of one another. In the courage, in, we're encouraged by believers. We're encouraged by your word. Amen, Lord. Would you do it, Lord? Would you do it? Have mercy. Mercy. Mercies, Lord, over judgment. Lord, do not look at the, the doll today for a moment. Look to the hearts of your believers and our prayers, Lord. Have mercy on them, Lord. They do not know what they are saying or doing. Father God, we need you. Father God, we need your son, Yeshua. Lord, we need the ministry of your Holy Spirit and the word of God. Oh, you can do it, Lord. You can take us simple vessels and do something amazing, amazing. We've made you too small in our sight, Lord. We magnify the name of Yeshua over this whole land, over every church, every pastor, every corner, every high hill and low place. We speak the name of Yeshua in reverence and in love. And we pray that it would, it would be a new day, a new season. We give you all the glory. Jesus.
was saved. You ascended to heaven and evermore will reign. At the end of the age when the earth you will claim, you will gather the nations before you. this place singing and dancing in the Lord. Amen. Lay your burden down. Amen. We're being rewired in the background here, so please don't let it distract you. I'm not being rewired. Praise God. Not yet. That day is coming. Uh, um, it says in Exodus chapter 15 these are a few, a few words from a song known as the song of Moses and the song of Moses is actually taken up in the book of Revelation again and it's, it's a song that we will sing in the future it's the song of those who haven't been marked by, by this world by, by the devil uh, and haven't taken the mark of the beast upon him upon themselves and they, they sing this song and this is just a part of it uh, verse 11 chapter 15 of Exodus who is like you O Lord among the gods with the little g who is like you glorious in holiness fearful in praises doing wonders and these verses just really kind of struck me. The first thing is God is glorious in holiness, right? What, what does that mean? We, we have a religious thing about holiness. Holiness really in essence is one of a kind, out on its own, unique, nothing like it. Set aside for extraordinary 
purpose. And so we should be a holy people too in that sense. But God is the only one that we can really truly say that he is holy. There is no one like him. We need that sense of, the, of, of who God really is. We get so caught up on all the things that are going on and the turmoil in the media and so on going on around us. We need to know who God is. And it was a very good question to ask that the son of, we were just, Pamela and I were just reading this dur during the week uh, from the book of Judges and the father of um, uh, Samson, his name is Manoah, and he asked God, he said, what is your name? <laughs> it's a good question to ask. And the reply he got was, was in essence this, it is wonderful. And we sing this, don't we? His name is, is wonderful. But actually, we miss out on something by, by having the translation of that term, it, it is wonderful. The name of God is, is wonderful. Actually, uh, the, the word in, in, in Hebrew is a pili. And that's the re Greek word, or the Hebrew word for miraculous, astonishing, right? The name of God is miraculous. God is astonishing, right? Do you expect God to do miracles, to be astonishing, not only in your life, but the life of the church in Ireland? Oh, have we hope that God will move, that, that the day of small things won't be, be the only day for the Irish church? Right? We, we need to know this. God is a miracle working God. And I want to speak about some of the miracles God has done in times past. Why? Well, I do love history because it tells me that what God has done, God is doing, and God will do in the future. And I'm reminded what Jesus said at the wedding the best wine is kept till. Amen. Amen. And we can lose this sense of wonder who God is, you know? There's, I don't know how many are here this morning. Miracles. Every, everyone in this room is a unique miracle of God. You and I would not be here unless God had done a miracle in our lives, right? The natural course of events would not have taken us to this place, either this place physically here this morning or the place we are with God in our own lives. The natural course of events would never have taken us there. We would never have evolved there it took a miracle of God to bring it about in your life and in mine right how about God does a miracle for a whole nation of people right whoa this is God scaling up what he's done in our lives right he's done miracle for the people of Israel in the past and the miracle he's done in our individual lives that has led to here today he plans to do again right on an unprecedented big scale for the people of Israel. Amen. So we can lose our sense of wonder of, of, of these things. So the fact that God has actually miraculously kept the nation of Israel over thousands of years is of incredible hope for me personally. If he can do that for them over such a long time span and in such miraculous way, surely he can do the same for you and I with our short little lives as well. So almost uh, the, God's dealing with the nation of Israel is a proof text of God's nature and character and how he will deal with you and I as well in our own lives. But I don't want to talk about you and me because so often the churches, it's all about us, right? And God wants us to look at something of the bigger picture uh, here together uh, this morning. And I just, I'm amazed by the Jewish people and what a miraculous nation of people they actually are. Their, their story is unique. There is absolutely no other nation like them on the face of the earth. And so we can call them a holy nation, right? There is a sinful nation, but they're a holy nation in that they're unique and God has set them aside in his own plans and purposes, you know, for, for a special occasion. We can easily lose the sense through familiarity. We can lose the sense of wonder on all of these things. And I, I, I want to open with some words of, of Mark Twain, and this is really familiar to some in the room, and it may not be familiar to others, but you know, repetition sometimes is a good thing. Uh, and and I just want to, uh, the sense of wonder of Mark Twain when he, when he wrote this, he said, if the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. Less, actually, I think. 
It suggests a, a nebulous dim puff of, of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of, but he is heard of, <laughs> has always been heard of. This is over 100 years ago, by the way, 150 years ago. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people, and his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. His contributions to the world list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, abstruse learning are also way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He's made a marvelous fight in the world, in all ages, and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain for himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, and they are gone. Other peoples have sprung up, held their torch high for a time, but it burned out, and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he has always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal, but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? That's the question he leaves with us. What is the secret of his immortality? And I think the answer is found on so many pages of the Bible, but we could look to Jeremiah chapter 46, verse 28, where it's God says, Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, says the Lord, for I am with you, for I will make a complete end of all the nations. That includes Ireland, by the way, to which I have driven you, right? God may make a complete end of Ireland. We have no guarantees. But God is saying, here's a guarantee. I will not make a complete end of you. I will rightly correct you, for I will not leave you wholly unpunished. So the first thing is God saying to Israel, I am with you, right? God is the only, Israel is the only nation on earth that God actually names himself by that nation. He calls himself the God of Israel, Israel right? And he says in this verse, uh, verse chapter 20, 46, verse 28, I will not make a complete end of you. The only nation that has that guarantee that from right to the end of history, Israel will remain. And actually, Israel in its redeemed form appears uh, beyond the end of, of history. And we can read that in the book of Revelation. Um, something eternal about the nation as well. And we've been grafted in by the way, to, to that eternal uh, Israel. And so it's easy to forget what God has done. It's something unprecedented. Israel is not a nation like all the other nations. They never have been. They never will be. It's very interesting. Mussolini looked back at ancient Rome and he tried to re restore it. He failed. Saddam Hussein, this is coming up a little bit more into our own time, he tried to revive, remember Saddam? The older ones of us do anyway, you know. He tried to revive the glories of ancient Babylon, right down to, I can remember looking at a Time magazine or Newsweek back in 1981 or something like that, and there were the, the works, the rebuilding works of the ancient city of Babylon, and I think it was every 10th or 100th brick, Saddam had his name stamped on it. Right? Just like Nebuchadnezzar did that with his bricks. And so this, these were the ambitions of Saddam. And he didn't come to uh, such a great end uh, either. Um, Hitler, he tried to revive the Holy Roman Empire. And that's why it's called the, the Third Reich. The Holy Roman Empire was the first kingdom. And uh, there was this attempt to revive the ancient glories. And uh, well, he, came to, he went to his own place. Uh, the Shah of Iran, do you remember him? Right? Well, his big downfall was a big dinner party held at the ancient city of, of Persepolis, you know, and he held this great party, and that was kind of basically the final straw for his people, and that was the end of Saddam. He was trying to uh, restore and look back to the glories of ancient Persia, uh, and it was his downfall. 
And then the Irish, you know, what did we try to revive? Uh, a couple of fuckle, right? And most of us, that's about it. You know, or, oh, sorry, sorry, on Wilk had the gum. You know, we all know that one as well, you know, but we haven't done really so well in over 100 years of trying to revive our, our, our language, you know. But no thanks to the Irish, no thanks to the nations of, of, of the world, the nation of Israel is back in its land after more than 2,000 years of exile, assimilation. Um, as Peg reminded us on, online there during the week, speaking the same language, having the same faith, reading the same holy book, worshipping the same God as their ancestor did like 3,000 years ago plus. No other nation, even on any one of those parameters, ticks the box. Israel ticks all of them. Coincidence? Or is this a miracle, that the hand of God? There have always been some Jews in the land of Israel. Well, I've I got to put a caveat on that. Except during the time of the Christian crusaders you know we managed to christians got rid of the jews in the land of israel but uh, but apart from the ministry of of so-called christianity right there have always been jewish people in the land of israel a, a remnant right the majority as we know were scattered to all the nations of the earth and there was a, a byword in times gone past the wandering jew you know we used to have a plant at one time in our home the wandering jew you know, and it was kind of a byword that they wandered the nations of the earth and they didn't have any land uh, of their own and no place to call their own. And the persecutions would arise from time to time and they'd move on. And I remember on, on a very poignant um, f uh, Zoom call I was on a, a year or two uh, ago here with some Irish Jews and uh, it came round to troubles in Ireland and so on. And one of the men on the call said, well, he said, I have my bags packed. And another man said, isn't that the story of our people? We always have to have our bags packed. It was such a sad thing for him, him to say. And this is a family who's lived in Ireland for over 100 years and so on, but never really at home. And this is a risen for the Jews, wherever they've been, they prosper for a while and then persecution comes and they... Uh, they have to move on. And so 2,000 years almost of this around the nations, right? Um, and here's the tragic thing. God actually scattered them out into the nations as, as his judgment of them. There's, the Bible is quite clear of that, and Moses warned them, right, of, of, of this as well in their lives. But here's the thing. When they were scattered, should there not have been Christian homes in all the nations of the earth where the Spirit of God had moved, where the doors would have been thrown open and, and said, welcome, people of God, come in. We love you. We want to bless you. We want to do you good in the name of the Lord. Where did that happen? Surely that was an opportunity, you know, really lost. The church wasn't there for them then. And you know, the church isn't there for them now. And it's a miracle the Jews survived intact and, and thrived, in fact, after uh, two millennia. And their return to the land at the end of that time is, is uh, a miracle. Unprecedented in human history. No other nation has, has, has done that. And the fact that the book that we hold tells us all about it, the return of the Jews, you know, is, is, is also uh, quite amazing and it's it, it's it, the Jews are full of amazing exceptions to, to the rule right out of out of the Holocaust right this would be a bit like Ireland getting its independence back you know within a couple of years of the great famine and everybody destroyed and all that terrible time in our own history right the Jews had their terrible time in their history the Holocaust as we know within three years right they were back in their own land as a state again after 2,000 years. The most unbelievable set of circumstances. It, it's, it's not possible except uh, God, God did this. Um, and here we are today, and if we could put up the first slide of its possible peg, it, it's up there. Um, here they are back in the land today, and in the context, I'm going to try to use one of these things. I'm an old-fashioned guy. There we go. No, it doesn't seem to be working. No, 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 slide number one. Yeah, there we are. 
Okay, it's hard to see, isn't it? It's very bright in here, which is, which is wonderful, right? So we're looking here at the, the, the land of Israel. There we are, just the little dot there, if you can see it, right? The rest of it is the Arab Muslim world that surrounds them, all right? As Peg sent me this slide, I think it's really good. Uh, 22 uh, Arab countries surrounding them. Um, almost half a billion people, 481 million, you know, uh, over 5 million square miles of land. That's the Arab Muslim world. And then compared to that, uh, 22 Arab countries, one Jewish state, you know, 7 million Jews as against 481. And square miles of land, instead of 5 million, it's point. 00855 tiny little dot the land of Israel and there they are they're, they're surrounded and we, we don't have we don't have time this morning but it's a really worthwhile study to go back into your Bibles particularly in the book of Genesis and have a look at the roots of of this conflict today it's a very ancient roots right uh, Obama and, and Biden and, and Blinken and all these other ones, our own Taoiseach, they ain't going to solve it, right? It is not solvable, right? Because the, at the roots of the conflict is a spiritual issue, and it can only be fixed spiritually. And essentially, at, at the roots of this is a counterclaim to the covenant of God, right, uh, by Abraham's other descendants, uh, Ishmael and Esau. So there's a claim, is, is, is Isaac the one? Is Jacob called Israel the one through whom the covenants and the promises of God descend down to the Messiah Jesus and all that he has done for them and us and, and will do for them again in the future? Or does it come down the other line that leads to Islam with Muhammad the promised one. That's not the God of the Bible, but the God of the Quran. And they make the claim to the promises spiritually, and they make the pr claim to the land physically as well. They say, it is ours. The covenant has been given to us. And they're very, they're very open and, 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 and clear about this. You know, it's only the, the stupid West and, and many Israeli politicians, to be quite honest, right, who actually don't get this think that, well, we can do a deal. No, you can't do a deal. The deal is not possible. And, and to, be, to be fair to Palestinians and the Arab world, they're, they're very open and honest about this. It's only, it's only ourselves who get our heads in, in, in a muddle in, in this, right? So the solution to the conflict is a spiritual one, and we need God to move, Amen. right? And we need to... Hold on. Oh, we have it up on the slide, don't we? The next one. It's uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's what we need to be doing. And um, <clears throat> we actually have a lot of leaflets on the back there, but I'm, we're, we're contacting churches right across Ireland and looking that tomorrow, two weeks, churches would set aside a few minutes at their, at their church meeting. Put aside the politics, right? That whatever you think of the problem, we do know that God needs to move and provide the solution. So it's utterly uncontroversial for every church to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we're calling uh, Sunday two weeks for churches actually to do that. Um, so just moving on, Jew hatred is, is not a new phenomena. It's not caused by the occupation of Palestine. Uh, it's not provoked by big bad Netanyahu, if only they, Israel had a better prime minister or, or whatever. It's not the right-wing Zionists. It's not the, 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 um, the settlements, so-called, and so on. Uh, Jew hatred is as old as the Jewish race, uh, the Jewish people itself. The world has always seen the Jews as being a problem. They saw the Jews as a problem long before there was the state of Israel, and they see the Jews... Uh, as a problem today. Uh, the hatred, the reason for that hatred has changed from generation to generation, but the hatred has remained uh, the same hatred. And this, this battle affects the whole world, this spiritual battle. 
And it's affecting Ireland today uh, big time. Uh, somebody once uh, described anti-Semitism as being a, a shapeshifter, and I think that's a good way uh, to describe it. And it's been really quite alarming. I'm sure you've been watching the news and so on to see the rise, not just globally, but in Ireland as well, of, of Jew hatred. You know, and for the Jewish community in Ireland have said to us, like, for the first time ever, they feel unsafe. We've had people saying our families during the war when they were living here did not feel unsafe, but they do now. Right? That's a, that's a terrible shame on us. And to have our own politicians chanting, some of them, from the river to the sea and calling for ethnic cleansing. And, and quite openly, one or two have actually said, I mean, the, the state of Israel needs to cease to exist, basically, right? The Zionist experiment has failed and it needs to end, right? It's, it's amazing. And even, even from Australia, they've, they've had chants in the streets that have been allowed to pass about gas the Jews. You know, this is an extraordinary thing. What other people, you know? Uh, does, does this happen to him? And we have a, a Jewish friend who's also a believer and says um, he doesn't speak Hebrew in public in Ireland, doesn't want to be identified uh, as being Jewish in any way because of, he feels this uh, risk to himself as well. And, and it's hard to overstate the shock that the events of October the 7th were to the Jewish community, not just in Ireland, um, but, but all around the world and so on. And in Ireland, no other ambassador, if we could put up the next slide, is treated the way that our ambassador, or the ambassador of Israel to Ireland is. Um, she's a sweet lady. You really need to pray for her, and I'm sure uh, some or many of you do, Dana Ehrlich. Um, I believe God has sent her here, and she's tender and sweet and um, lovely woman, and she needs our prayers, and she needs our love, and she needs our support at this difficult time, just on a human level, if not anything else. So if you think of her, send her an email, tell her you love her. Um, but there's something about Israel that forces men and women to reveal what's actually in their hearts. You know, and it's been astonishing uh, to witness over the last few years the, the world's media organizations, the world's governments, the world's NGOs, the world's gay community, right? Gays for Gaza. <laughs> they wouldn't last 10 minutes in Gaza. They'd be straight off a rooftop or, or worse, you know. I mean, the, the, but the, the intersectionality, this is one of the buzzwords of our age, you know. All of these things are coming together. They, they, they have nothing in common with one another apart from their hatred of Israel. The feminists and even the climate changers, what's her name? That young girl has been up there. Yeah, yeah, Greta. Right? It's no longer climate change. It's now she's moving on to... Uh, anyway. So there, it's, it's basically a fellowship of evil united with this uh, common cause. Uh, the hatred of Israel and actually the hatred of Jewish people everywhere. And they, they feel it and know it. And By the way, when, when that lot are finished with the Jews, they are moving on to us. Right? So we do have, as they say, skin in the game here. Right, to, to, to pray for this, and we need to be clear about that. They hate us too. And, and the churches are silent on this as if it had nothing to do with us whatsoever. You know, it has an awful lot to do with us, uh, folks. And the decision by our leaders to unilaterally recognize the state of Palestine was the day I was ashamed to be Irish. It was a reward for terror. <laughs> Thank you. It was actually a reward for terrorism, right? And the Palestinians understand that, you know, and certainly the Israelis understand that as, as well. And I was really so glad, and I know there are some here who were able to join us to be able to stand outside Leinster House a few weeks ago and show solidarity with the, the Jewish people, but also to show that it's not all Irish people. Right? Our government and our politicians don't speak for all of us. And so we may be a small voice, but we are a voice. And we won't be silent in these days. And I know the Jewish community in Ireland really appreciated that. And, and, and so did the Israelis, by the way. I managed to um, get invited onto Israeli TV. How about that? Last time I looked, um, there were nearly 80,000 YouTube hits on the on the. I wish I could monetize it. <laughs> 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 
but I haven't been able to figure out how, you know. But Israel got something of another message from Ireland. Here's, here's the hope. But, And, and they need this. Going back a few years ago, Pamela and I were walking the streets of Jerusalem wearing these Irish t-shirts, right? And somebody called out to us, you're Irish. I thought that you all hate us. What a reputation, you know, to have. It was terrible to hear those words, right? And thankfully, I was able to say, no, no, no. There are some of us, we're, we're a new type of Irish man and Irish woman. We love Israel. We, we bless you. Uh, we care for you. You're not alone, right? But you know, in past generations, there were Irish men and women who loved the Jewish people. Did you know that? We're not the first, right? We come in a long line of wonderful Irish men and Irish women, Irish men and women who understood the plans and the purposes of God for the Jewish people. And they did what they could do in their generation, and now it's our turn to do what we can do in our generation. And some of the names that spring to mind is a man called Henry Grattan Guinness. Don't know if you've heard of him. Yeah. Uh, there was a woman called Mary Elms. Who's from Cork? Mary from Cork. You know, and she saved Jewish children in, in Vichy, France during the war. And we went out to have a look at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. And sure enough, there's her name, Mary Elms, Ireland. Wonderful. One, you know. Uh, righteous among the Gentiles. Praise God. And then there was a man from, who's from Longford or down around that direction? Anyone from Longford? Oh, the, the, there's a handful. John Henry Patterson, right? And he was from, I think, Coolamber, Coolamber House, possibly, uh, down in, in, in Longford. And, uh, you know, I mention these names because as a, as a little nation, do you know, we, we, we do delude ourselves at times, but we like to think about ourselves that we punch above our weight, you know, that we're this little voice on the world stage. But actually, there's an element of truth in it. We do at times punch above our weight. And the, the men and women I've just mentioned there uh, had an impact, and I don't have time to talk about all of them, so I've just picked one, and it was the first one, uh, because when I was in Jerusalem, somebody said to me, Thanks for the Guinness, you know. And I said, you're very welcome, you know. But actually, I was thinking of a different Guinness. Because the Guinness I was thinking of was, was an evangelist and, and a preacher of the gospel in Ireland in the mid-19th century. And he, he moved to England as well uh, at that time. He was a grandson of Arthur Guinness, the man with the pint, you know. And he wrote and taught extensively about the end times. I actually have two of his main books at home. And he identified in his studies in the book of Daniel, right, some key dates for the reestablishment of the state of Israel, right? This is in the middle of the 19th century, by the way. And he said, 1897, 1917, 1923, and 1948. That's kind of a pretty remarkable record. And so, 1897, the first Jewish Zionist con Congress, right, um, led by, by um, uh, Theodore Herzl, who said, within 50 years of this, there will be a Jewish state. He was spot on, but he was a year out. It was a year later. <laughs> Not bad. Right. 1917, the Balfour Declaration uh, was signed, um, which was really, it wasn't a legal document, but it stated that, that, that as on behalf of the British government that the Jewish people did have a rightful claim uh, uh, to the land. In December 1917, same year, the British finally expelled the Turkish occupiers from what was known as the land of Palestine at the time. I'm coming back to this in a minute. 1948, of course, right? Uh, the reestablishment of, of Israel on the 15th of May as, as a nation. And believers all around the world celebrated, right? The inerrancy of scripture and God fulfilling his promises, right? I wouldn't suggest, by the way, going back to the Bible yourself and working out the dates for the Lord's return because he's told us those dates nobody knows but he did tell us we can know the season 
So let's not get ourselves kind of tied up on all of these things, but we can look back and see the faithfulness of God here. And then after his death, Guinness died in 1910, so he didn't actually see uh, the, the, the mandate and, and the, uh, the, the Turkey being expelled and so on and so forth. But in 1917, the, the, there, was, there was war. And um, if you remember, the, the Turkey entered the war and they had this vast, strong Ottoman Empire and Palestine was just one little province within the, the mighty uh, empire. And Britain went to, they went to war against Britain. And if you remember Britain, Winston Churchill, if you know your history, right, he was in charge of a disastrous campaign at a place called Gallipoli, right? And the, the British forces lost a huge number and they were bogged down on the beach. So there was no pushover, right? Uh, the Turks were no pushover, right? Well, come 1917, the British were uh, trying to push into the land of what, what was known then as, as Palestine, right? They were bogged down at Gaza. And this is 1917. And the general just wasn't making a breakthrough. And he got the sack. And there was a new general appointed, a man called General Allenby, right? He was not over the moon about the appointment. He knew how difficult this was and it was going to be. And he was depressed, and he was sitting at his home in England, depressed about this, and a friend came to see him. And his friend was thrilled. His friend said, Alan B., it's 1917. <laughs> he said, I have a book at home, right? 1917 is the date. You're going to be in Jerusalem by Christmas. And he showed him the book and encouraged Alan B. And so armed with encouragement, Allenby went out, and of course he defeated uh, the, the Turks, and he entered Jerusalem. Not a shot was fired in the defense of Jerusalem. And there was another miracle in that. What was the miracle? Well, it was two. Number one, the Arabs had a proverb saying it's not possible to take Jerusalem, except the proverb was more flowery, and it said this, when the Nile flows into Palestine, then shall the prophet from the west drive the Turk from Palestine, right? When the Nile flows into Palestine and when there's a prophet from the west, of course, the prophet was from the east, it was Muhammad, right? And the Nile, how is that going to flow into Palestine? It didn't flow that direction at all. Well, the British built a pipeline and piped water up from the Nile for their troops. And the story went out, whoa, the Nile has come to Palestine. And then, and then, Allenby, al Nabi is his name in Arabic, and it means prophet of God. Now, is this really a coincidence? So the Arabs just laid down their arms when it came to the city of Jerusalem because they were really spooked, you know? And it's, it was a miracle, right? And through the life work of Henry Grattan Guinness, all of those little things of faithfulness that he did had a, a very big consequence down the road. And so the Irish had a role to play in all of this. And we could go on and talk about the other Irish men and women, and, and it's a wonderful so. So Guinness looked forward to that. We can look back to it. And here's what Guinness wrote in 1878. He said, however impossible it may appear that Palestine should ever again be the home of a mighty Jewish nation, scripture leaves no room to doubt that such will be the case. Amen. 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 Where did he get that from? The Bible, right? And so we could say, thanks for the Guinness, just like that Jewish man did, right? Um, I mention these because these, these men and women are part of our legacy, right? And it's important we don't forget them. We're, 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 we're their descendants. And we have a responsibility for Ireland, every one of us. I, I, it's never forgotten me. Paul, I, I, I'd like to quote you when you're not here, but I will quote you now. You are here. 
Paul said to us at the end of one meeting somewhere, he said something along the lines of, you are the government of Ireland in waiting. You know, I've never forgotten it. And it's actually, it's actually true. And we need to develop that mindset, right? And take responsibility for our own people. Anti-Semitism, hostility to Israel. It's not in our DNA. It can be learned. And if it can be learned, it can be unlearned. And so I was kind of thinking, Peg, if you could put the next one up, it would be great. This is Peg's design, if you can see it so well. What it, what it is, I, I found myself wondering, well, if we're going to, you, do you know, before Ireland had independence, the, 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 some people set up their own parallel government. Now, I'm not for a moment, we must be absolutely 100% subject to the powers of Ireland. We are not leading coups and so on. But we need a mindset that we have a spiritual responsibility for our nation. And the Bible says, and Jesus promises, that if we're faithful to him in little, he will give us rule and he will give us authority in the future. So, but we need to be faithful now and love our own people if we're ever expecting, right, to have any rule with Jesus and so on. I, I found myself wondering, what would a new flag of Ireland look like? It certainly won't be a tricolor. Now, this is going to be millennium stuff, right? Well, green, it's got to be green, right? It's our national color for obvious reasons, right? But also, I thought green is, green is the color of that great rainbow, around the throne of God himself, right? So a background of green, I think that's appropriate for a new Irish flag. Then the harp, right? Uh, a harp has always been associated with Ireland. And I found myself thinking, well, why the harp? And I think the harp comes from the, from the, the, the throne room of the Ard Re himself, right? The place of the worship uh, and, and praise and song and music in the presence of the High King of Ireland. And, uh, what, what more fitting emblem for Ireland uh, for those future days, right, than we recognize that the government of Ireland actually is not going to be a democracy, right? It's a monarchy, you know? We're not going to get a vote. And if we belong to the Lord now, do you know, we don't get a vote. And he doesn't need our advice either. We just need to put ourselves at his disposal and say, yes, sir whatever it is, and I feel really uncomfortable doing this, right? And can I just say something about one thing that really upsets me at times in leadership, and I'm sure it's the same for others who are pastors here, right? Things need doing. And you go and ask somebody to do something and they say, I'll pray about it. <laughs> now, that's fair. if that's genuine, right? Really genuine. That's, that's fair enough. And I've had people I've asked, would you do this for me? And it's been a big deal. And they've been really busy people. And they have gone off and prayed about it. And they come back and uh, very often they've said, yes, I will. Right? But don't use, I'll pray about it as an Irish Christian way of saying, no way, Jose. Right? Because I usually find that the people who pray about it always come back and say no. And it really upsets kind of pastors and so on. We're, let's put ourselves, you know, at disposal of our churches and our pastors and church leaders and so on. We're not to kind of say, well, I'm too busy working with Israel and the Christian embassy to help out in the church. That should never be the case, right? If, if we're in churches, and we should be in churches, we have a responsibility to 100% give ourselves to the building of the church of God. Right? In, this, in this land and in your own locality uh, as well. And then finally, the 12 stars, right? The, the, the star of David, and there's 12 of them representing the, the tribes of Israel. And this is God's uh, European Union, right? Uh, this is God bringing the nation together um, and, and under God's rule from his chosen place, which is the city of Jerusalem. That's where God's going to rule from. And I'd just like to speak for a few minutes. Um, and I'm just watching the time um, about Jerusalem. And then we'll call this to a close. Right? Jerusalem was called uh, um, by, by, by Jesus, right, the city of the great king. Jerusalem is Jesus' city. And the, 
at the end of the day, the, the, the battle at the moment is in Gaza, and very possibly next week, right, a, a much larger front is going to open up big time uh, up in the north, right, with Lebanon. And that's been going on for months and really underreported or maybe not reported at all really in the media. And everybody's going to be shocked and horrified and so on. But there's 80,000 Israeli citizens can't live in the north of Israel at all for the last six months because of the daily bombardment and rockets coming in and all the rest of it. And this has got to be sorted out and it will be sorted out, but Israel get the blame for it. But so what, what's new? Um, Jerusalem is, is, is a funny old city because it really doesn't have much in the way of natural advantages. I remember the first time Pamela and I went together and Pamela said, where are the mountains? And I said, what mountains? And she said, well, the mountains are round about Jerusalem. You know, the song that we sing, you know, where are the mountains? Well, they're not really mountains. You know, you want mountains, you better go to the Alps or somewhere like that, you know. Um, and then when it comes to look kind of the, you know, if you want kind of great ancient monuments and stuff like that, Israel is pretty thin on the ground. You know, the walls there are like 400 years old and, you know, I know they're digging up stuff and so on, the city of David and so on, but the, these great monuments that other nations can boast of, the pyramids or uh, you go to Athens if you want to see these great ancient temples and so on, Israel, Jerusalem's not really kind of, it's not the place for that either, you know. Well, what about a river, you know, the great rivers of the Rhine or, you know, the Colorado River or whatever. Um, Jerusalem's river, oh, it doesn't have one. Well, not yet. It's got to have one, you know, one day, you know. So natural advantages, Jerusalem really doesn't have much going for it. But it has one advantage over all the other cities of the world. And it says in Psalm 132, it says, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. It's going to be where the great king comes to live when he does come. And so Jerusalem is, is the city of the great king. And Jesus called that himself. And if it's the city of Jesus, the nations need to be very careful what they do with the city of Jerusalem. It's his city. It's not even a Jewish city. It's the city of God. It's the city of, of, of Jesus himself. And, you know, it's a, what, we, we think of the, the coming of, of the Messiah and so on, the second coming. That's the great church expectation. It should be. Actually, it's really rarely preached on, by the way. Um, but the coming of the Messiah is 100% a Jewish expectation. Did you know that? 100%. It's a Jewish expectation. Uh, Maimonides in the 12th century wrote, I believe with perfect faith that the Messiah will come, and though he tarry, I will wait daily for his presence. And you know, Jews do wait daily for his presence. I was at the synagogue in Terenur there a, a few weeks ago, invited to a thing, and uh, they prayed, May the Redeemer come unto Zion. And the congregation loudly said, Amen. Right? They know they need a redeemer and they know where he's coming to as well. And so Jerusalem is, is ground zero for, for the whole world. And what happened in Jerusalem in the past has affected every single human being on the planet. And it's affected you and I here. Our sins were forgiven in Jerusalem. Spiritually, you and I were actually born in Jerusalem, but we can't go into that. You were there in Christ that day on the cross. You were actually born in Jerusalem. And with him, you were raised from the dead spiritually in Jerusalem as well. So that's why if, you, if you've been there and feel an affinity to the city of Jerusalem, it's actually because you're a native. You were born there, you know, and you're only going home if you do go there. Do come with us this year. We're planning to go out in October. And if you'd like to come, we'll give you information at the back at the desk there. But Zechariah, just finishing up, Zechariah says uh, there's a coming game changer of a day. We mustn't forget God is still the God of miracles. And it said, in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Amen. And so what God began at the city of Jerusalem, he's bringing to a conclusion you know, at Jerusalem as well. Now, there is, there is a problem here. And the problem is this. I remember uh, we were in Jerusalem uh, at a meeting and we were addressed by the chief rabbi of Ephrat, 
His name is Shlomo Riskin, right? And he said, when the Messiah comes, he said, he said, I'm going to go to him and ask him a question. He said, I'm going to say, excuse me, sir. <laughs> Have you been here before? <laughs> or is this your first time? <laughs> it's an old joke, but it's, 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 it's worth it. Uh, telling and I, I trust the, the identity of who the Messiah is will be revealed to the Jewish people long before that, right? But there's a stumbling block to the revealing of that identity to the Jewish people and it's been the attitude and the actions of the church to, to Jews down through the centuries. The, the cross is the symbol of the persecutor and the name of Jesus is the name and the face that they would see as being the one who hates them. That's been the image of Jesus down 2,000 years of history. We have a job to redeem the name of Jesus in the eyes of the Jewish people. And that's what uh, the work of the ICJ is actually all about. There's a very interesting book if you're into history. It's called Europe and the Jews by a man called Malcolm Hay, written about 50 years ago. You should get it. Uh, it's out of print. But I just want to read a couple of bits and then I'm finished for coffee, Pamela. Um, he says, The whole civilized world has a short memory when Jews are the victims. Um, and he, he talks about the, the pogroms and so on. I, we don't have time for this. But at the end of talking about the pogrom, he says, And... And the pogrom, by the way, when I use that term pogrom, I'm talking about what happened in, in um, uh, October the, the, the 7th, right? It, the words aren't even repeatable, what, what read here, but they're just appalling stuff. And he said, the local bishop drove in a carriage and passed through the crowd, giving them his blessing as he passed. You know, that's the reputation we have. Oh, by the way, on the same page, it talks about uh, Michael Davitt got an honourable mention, you know, as an Irish man who loved the Jewish people, spoke up for them and advocated on, on their behalf and so on. So it's not a set in concrete. I know, Fiona, you're going to do, do that. Okay. So the Jewish people, like, like us Irish, they've got long memories. Um, we have a lot of work to do to redeem the name of Jesus, but that's the work of the Christian embassy. Um, we're responsible for the Jewish people and we're aware of our responsibility to them as well. And it hasn't been an easy work down through decades. I know Paul and Nuala were involved right back at the beginning uh, with the Christian embassy. Building bridges, earning trust takes time, but it's been effective. And you know, it's so effective. I, I, the most moving things I've event of my life, I think, are walking the streets of Jerusalem uh, as Christians and people stretching their hands out to us with tears rolling down their cheeks and saying, thank you for coming. We love you. We bless you, right? And I remember the first time I saw this, I turned to an elderly lady who was there, and I said, isn't this amazing? Surely Jesus is coming back any moment. They're so tender. And she said, they haven't always been like this, dear. When we started doing this, they turned their backs to us as we walked past. So love is effective to melt the heart down and show the face of Jesus uh, to them. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of information at the back, what we, what we do, but on Sunday nights, we pray. So if you're free on Sunday nights, we can send you the link, and usually 20 or even up to 30 people, we come on to a Zoom call, and if you want to pray, that's fine. If you don't, it's from seven to eight every Sunday night. So if you'd like to join us, there's information, you can sign up for that at the back. Um, We'd like you to, Fiona, can I just finish? Thank you. Uh, standing with Israel is really important. So if there are practical events that you come to, like today, that's, that's really important as well. And then, then giving. And uh, our giving is an effective way to put love into action. And I just want to put up just the last picture there. This is a motorbike. I was coveting the motorbike somebody had parked outside. And I was thinking, we could use that bike. But no, I, I joke. You know, this is actually motorbikes that they use in Israel uh, for their, 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 it's called the Magen David Adam, MDA, but they're, a, they're a, an, an Israeli Red Cross. 
and they're basically their ambulance service. It's a completely, a completely voluntary organization. And so if you have a heart attack or a traffic accident or a terrorist incident or whatever, no matter whether you're Jew or Arab or anybody, right, one of these bikes will turn up within a very small number of minutes in and out of the traffic. They're especially equipped and everything else with all sorts of medical equipment. The, even the driver has a body camera on him so it can connect into the local hospital where the consultant can have a look and they can do triage and all that kind of stuff long before you arrive at the hospital, right? So on the back of it, this one here, you can't see it, but it has a little sign saying donated by. And so what we're doing as an Irish branch of the ICEJ, we want that donated by to be on a motorbike in Israel driving around. So the first thing somebody, when they open their eyes after a traffic accident, they can see donated by Ireland, right? And it's just a little step of redeeming our name. So there's information on how you can do that at, at, at the back and bank details and all that kind of stuff. But I am, uh, no, I'm under pressure, for, I'm into overtime here. So I'm just going to ask the basket to be passed around Fiona, if we could do that, just for a collection to defray expenses. But there are leaflets on our National Day of Prayer, and there are leaflets in our partnership for saving lives with regards to this motorbike as well. So if you'd like to be involved in that, please um, sign up. So thank you. Nula, just one word and then it's coffee. I want to say something. I just want to read a scripture concerning the debt we owe Israel as your giving. Now, this is the word of God. And a lot of people say, oh, I believe in the word. But when it comes to Israel, they don't believe in the word. All of the word. This is one Bible. They say the old and the new. We're in the new. We're not in the old. It's one Bible from beginning to end. Romans chapter 15 says, For if the Gentiles, that's you and me, have been partakers of their spiritual things and haven't we been, we wouldn't be here except that. Their duty... Their duty, the word of God says it's our duty, is also to minister to them in material things. And material things include your money. You see, and now, you know, the Christian Embassy magazine tells you all the things they do, not just the motorbike. That's what they're hoping to do, something new. But they have done so many things. The special ministry to Holocaust survivors. Incredible things. And so it's your duty to give you out of your pocket. And I know I've seen the work they do. I've seen the sacrifices of those in Paul's So let's obey the word of God. Hey, amen. Thank you, Dula. We're, we're, we're going to break for 20 minutes, and then I'm going to ring a bell. So... Bull on plug. Uh, isn't that right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and, and we, if we can come back then uh, promptly and we, we keep on time for lunch. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> no, no, perfect. No, look. I actually had it on my notes, the same verse. So, but I, we ran out of time. Good morning, good. Um, I have, the advantage you have in this is I'm 72 years of age. I served 23 years as an Irish soldier, and I served in Lebanon. I also went on a lovely big tour with the Kilkenny Presbyterian Church from a biblical standpoint. This man today, Psalm 115, verse 1, to God be the glory, he made my day for me and my wife to come here today. I make no, I make no bones in making, and I'm not ashamed of that I have, when the, you talked about the Taoiseach and all that, I rang his office. I rang his private secretary. You do not speak for me. I said, the God of Abraham gave that land to Abraham, to Israel. Alan Shatter, uh, I contacted him, and that's how we, we talked about our good friend, the ambassador. You know, we told her we loved her. And um, my good friend, Jerry Deneen there, he sent the email to him and Tim O'Connell from Newmarket. 
But she was amazed that, that you know, what, what we as ex-soldiers, what we do. But I just want to say, that's what I do. And um, in our church in Ennis, we, we do pray for Israel every, every day. And I, I want to say to you, I'm 32 years a Christian. I'm, I, if the house is on fire, I don't care. More I'll tell you. We'll, I'll still do my quiet time. And I still praise God. And I, I thank God. For his, and, I t and I was attacked verbally by Sinn Féin up in Ennis. And I stood there. I said, I claim the blood of Jesus Christ. I said, who are you to knock me, I said, or tell me? I didn't care. And that's, this is what I'm saying, what God has done for me. Even as a soldier when I was out there, I, couldn't, I was on the main line access to When the IDF advanced at 615 Alpha, I was standing there and I said, Shalom. And I saluted the officer. And, and I pulled, I did, I, I, I gave him the respect, you know, and I, I want to say to you, everywhere we went on the tour, when, I, when me and Mara went out with the Kilkenny Presbyterian Church, we went to, uh, every place we went, we had a sermon, a bit like what you were after, but, but do not be ashamed, lads, because, and, and you see, this, this man said, we are next, I, I, I want to tell you, I have no fear of dying, and more I'll tell you, I love the Lord, and I don't, I don't care what they say, think, or do, and the same with the government. And I've gone to politicians, and I told them, if the leaders are bad, the whole country is bad. And that's what I'm saying. We need to pray for government and local government. Now, Gurmaha Gutkwemenan Kaintif, Augustan Farshaw, thank you.